to Ebenezer Thayer, Esquire. Sir, in all the calamities which have ever befallen this country, we have never felt so great a concern or such alarming apprehensions as on this occasion. Such is our loyalty to the King, our veneration for both Houses of Parliament, and our affection for all our fellow subjects in Britain, that measures which discover any unkindness in that country towards us are the more sensibly and intimately felt. And we can no longer forbear complaining that many of the measures of the late ministry and some of the late acts of Parliament have a tendency, in our apprehension, to divest us of our most essential rights and liberties. We shall confine ourselves, however, chiefly to the Act of Parliament commonly called the Stamp Act by which a very burdensome and, in our opinion, unconstitutional tax is to be laid upon us all. And we, subjected to numerous and enormous penalties, to be prosecuted, sued for, and recovered at the option of an informer in a court of admiralty without a jury. We have called this a burdensome tax because the duties are so numerous and so high, and the embarrassments to business in this infant, sparsely settled country so great that it would be totally impossible for the people to subsist under it if we had no controversy at all about the right and authority of imposing it. Considering the present scarcity of money, we have reason to think the execution of that act for a short space of time would drain the country of its cash, strip multitudes of all their property, and reduce them to absolute beggary. And what the consequence would be to the peace of the province from so sudden a shock and such a convulsive change in the whole course of our business and subsistence we tremble to consider. We further apprehend this tax to be unconstitutional. We have always understood it to be a grand and fundamental principle of the Constitution that no free man should be subject to any tax to which he has not given his own consent, in person or by proxy. And the maxims of the law, as we have constantly received them, are to be the same effect, that no free man can be separated from his property, but by his own act or fault. We take it clearly, therefore, to be inconsistent with the spirit of the common law and of the essential fundamental principles of the British Constitution that we should be subject to any tax imposed by the British Parliament because we are not represented in that assembly in any sense unless it be by a fiction of law as insensible in theory as it would be injurious in practice if such a taxation should be grounded on it. But the most grievous innovation of all is the alarming extension of the power of courts of admiralty. In these courts, one judge presides alone. No juries have any concern there. The law and the fact are both to be decided by the same single judge whose commission is only during pleasure and with whom, as we are told, the most mischievous of all customs has become established, that of taking commissions on all condemnations, so that he is under a pecuniary temptation always against the subject. Now if the wisdom of the mother country has thought the independency of the judges so essential to an impartial administration of justice as to render them independent of every power on earth, independent of the king, the lords, the commons, the people, nay independent in hope and expectation of the heir apparent, 
by continuing their commissions after a demise of the crown. What justice and impartiality are we, at 3,000 miles distance from the fountain, to expect from such a judge of admiralty? We have all along thought the acts of trade in this respect a grievance, but the Stamp Act has opened a vast number of sources of new crimes, which may be committed by any man and cannot but be committed by multitudes, and prodigious penalties are annexed, and all these are to be tried by such a judge of such a court. What can be wanting after this but a weak or wicked man for a judge to render us the most sordid and forlorn of slaves? We mean the slaves of a slave of the servants of a minister of state. We cannot help asserting, therefore, that this part of the act will make an essential change in the constitution of juries, and it is directly repugnant to the great charter itself. For by that charter, no immersement shall be assessed, but by the oath of honest and lawful men of the vicinage. And no free man shall be taken or imprisoned, or deceased of his freehold, or liberties of free customs, nor passed upon, nor condemned, but by lawful judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land. So that this act will make such a distinction and create such a difference between the subjects in Great Britain and those in America as we could not have expected from the guardians of liberty in both.